Hi there, this is Jeremy Howard from Answer AI, and uh, I am here with Carson from HTMX. And um, Carson's probably not going to like this if I introduce him in two glowing terms because he's a very humble man, but I can't help it. There's just mm. a few people in the world, very few people in the world, who I assign the epithet genius to. And oh, Carson on is one of the, I told you, <laughs> he's one of the very few. <laughs> Uh, he he looks and sounds like a um, little league baseball coach, and that's because he is. I'm sure he's a very good one as well. But that is not the genius that I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to talk about HTMX. So, Carson, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, <laughs> I appreciate you saying that, but uh, no, I can't agree with that. Um, I do. I, I do look like a baseball coach, and I am a baseball coach. Are you a good do, one? Do your little leaguers I'm, say that you do a good I'm, job? I, 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 you know, uh, baseball makes people crazy. So I, I have a lot of people that like me and then a couple of people that don't. And so I'll leave it at that. But I love it. And I, I feel like very I'm, few of them know about your, your other life. Um, yeah, it is definitely pretty funny sometimes. So I'll just be like, man, <laughs> this is very different than, I love it. than my online. That's life, great. So, well, something yeah. we both share in common is that we live a long way away from everybody else doing what we're doing and we do things in a probably yeah. a really different way to everybody else so yeah. that's where i wanted to start you know um uh, htmx is like the most misunderstood piece of technology i've come across in my god how long i've been coding for 40 years of coding <laughs> so i wanted to help people understand it and sure i think the best way for people to understand it would be be to read your damn book so I'm just going to share yeah. like that on the screen, but that would be sure. for a pretty short interview. So here's your damn book. I uh, mean, yep. not just you, you and Adam and Dennis. Hypermedia.systems, yeah. cool domain name. And the whole yep. thing's free, for God's sake. What are you trying to do? <laughs> you're like, <laughs> yeah, you're not you going to be actually... a unicorn at this rate. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, uh, books are not a good way to make much money I'm in better. general. Um, <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, and uh, even worse, I uploaded the EPUB to LibGen. Uh, so yes. if people, if people want, if they people don't want to pirate your EPUB, book, they can. If they want to pirate, they can do so with my blessing. No, but um, they're not going to do that now because part of getting stuff off LibGen is like you know sticking it to the man. And if you're like uploading it there yourself, yeah. it's like. Why even bother? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I figured someone was going to do it anyway, so it might as well be me. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a hardcover that's, uh, if you really, if you want to spend some money on a physical artifact, the hardcover, it's pricey. And uh, my understanding is it's hard to get in Australia. Um, but uh, it uh, it has a really cool cover um, that was done by US Graphics. Um, really, really happy with that. And then we just released the soft cover too. Um, yes. Which, Is that on Lulu with the beautiful that's on Lulu. pixel art? And that's, yeah, that that's so got cool. a pixel art cover that uh, we're super happy with. Um, it's uh, we, there was a, a, a pixel artist on Fiverr named Ash and uh, he did an unbelievable job with it. So uh, super happy with that. Yeah. I love it. And one of the few pieces of software were released recently that was initially available only on floppy disk for which yeah I'm yeah we did that for a couple of weeks uh we had a we had floppy disks um i don't think they're available on the store anymore but you could uh, buy them for a little bit well. so yeah we have some fun so Might as well have some fun an interesting thing about your book is that actually the entire first part not just the first chapter but the entire first part isn't about your thing at all it's about yeah it's about html and http i guess yep so i wanted yeah. to start there because some of the like so i've been coding for a while um mm -hmm. and i hadn't quite noticed until recently that there's a whole generation of people who are competent full-time coders are not familiar with any of the basic concepts of the web because they program at a totally different level of abstraction, which is like, right. you know, React and JSX and all that. So I thought like right. it might be fun to go back to, <laughs> you know, a <laughs> uh, an existing web 1.0 web page. Here's Richard Storman's sure. personal current website. Oh, and yeah. 
Could you like just teach us a little bit about what's going on here? What are the underlying things? What's the buttons? Sure. Like what are the what are the affordances provided right. by the web that Richard's using here? Yeah. Yeah. So this is very much an old school, very, very old school uh, uh, web page, you know, and there's always been this tension on the web. Like, is it a document? Is it, or is it, is the web about documents or is it about something more than documents? Um, and how, and if so, how much more? And so here um, you can see sort of a standard web 1.0 style web page with a bunch of uh, links or anchor tags um, that link to various things and let you click on them. Um, okay, and then so let's also look at one. So I'll just click here. So inspect. So here is yeah. uh, an anchor tag. So it's an, an anchor tag. tag. Okay. Yeah. And so the important, um, the important thing here is the href attribute. So uh, that href attribute, which specifies uh, another URL um, that when you click on the, on the text that's in inside that tag, um, the, the browser, which is a hypermedia client, is going to issue it is. an HTTP get. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, it's going to take whatever the, the hypermedia response is to that and then load it into the browser. Um, that, how, how it's loaded can be affected by a bunch of different things, um, uh, affordances. So uh, there could be a response header that tells it to do something specific, maybe do a redirect or something like well, that. Well, let's take but, a look because, um, you know, we can, something I definitely encourage people to do is to kind of watch their browser doing mm -hmm. that, which you can by popping open yep. here. And if I refresh, we can see. Yeah, there it is. If you go ahead and, yep. Exactly. So you can see this is the response that came back from that get request. And so you can see the, the request URL that it was made to and and just a bunch of these are all, these are headers. These are basically name value pairs. And there are some that are sent as part of the request. And then there are some that come back as part of the response as well. Um, and that's so that's all response, tied up. And uh, well, that's actually the body yeah. of the response. But I guess we should look at yeah. the response headers. Yep. Yeah, yeah. These are the response headers. So you know, there's an e tag in there, and that's what they actually. All this, look like. all this, yeah. All that's what it looks like when it, it's raw. Yeah. So HTTP. So the, what, what you're looking at here is sort of a partial representation of HTTP, which is the underlying transfer protocol, the hypertext transfer protocol. It's what HTTP stands for. Um, that's the that's the core network uh format for the web and that's how web browsers in general make requests even so we when basically you so i was just going to say Carson, we basically have two affordances here right one affordance is like underlined things i can click on just the yeah. links or anchors and the other right. is a form i can fill out with a button and one of the interesting yep. things you point out in your book is in terms of like html itself yeah. That's it. The entire set of affordances <laughs> provided to interact with a web page are those two things. Yeah, yeah. Affordance is a it's it's such a broad word that I think people could uh, could argue about but that. But those are the two primary interactive affordances, uh, or a, another term I would use for those is they're the two main hypermedia controls, mm. um, interactive hypermedia controls mm. um, in HTML. So so uh, taking a step back again, when you've got so how does the web work? Well, you've got documents. Let's just start with documents, and this is a this is an HTML document stored somewhere yep. and uh when that document comes down uh embedded within the presentation information are these interactive elements um uh, the control elements is what roy field so the a tags is. and the form tags a tag and a tags and forms and you, you can also argue that like an image is a hypermedia control um because it, it's going to drive another request that downloads an image element that's then inserted in. so there's a you can get into the weeds and that kind of stuff but it's but not interactive for, to use your terminology from earlier yeah it's not it's not something that the user selects you know when fielding talks about what makes the web special he he talks about users selecting actions based so who's on fielding uh, sorry, Roy Fielding. Roy mm -hmm. Fielding is the uh, guy who wrote uh, uh, the the famous or somewhat famous. It was much more famous, I guess, in the past um, dissertation on the web architecture, and that's what gave us the term REST. 
Yep. Um, so uh, that dissertation, he and I'm, I'm gonna to be honest with you, the dissertation is is a little hard to read. Um, but uh, but one of these core ideas with the web has always been the embedding of interactive uh, information directly in the the document in the presentation information. And so you have this mixing of concerns between the presentation as well as the the network stuff you can do with the presentation. Now in yeah. a document like like fieldings, like, you know, it's, it's hard to, for a lot of people. It's like, these are just links. They're just links yeah. to other documents. Yeah. And that's true. Um, but then that form starts to get at what really, you know, uh, I think HTML two added forms. And when forms were added as a hypermedia control, uh, that really changed. That the, yep. Yeah. And so you can see there it's action rather than href. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's good or bad. There's a lot of inconsistencies in HTML. It's a very, it was grown very organically. And so, um, here's the text, but box. the, yeah. Yep. And so forms are much more complicated because they, you know, the, the, the form of the request that's made depends on the state of the inputs inside the form and all this other stuff. Um, you can also issue posts. So you see there it says method equals post. Mm. So it's going to make a it's going to make an HTTP post request rather than a get request, which is what we saw for the links. Yeah. Um, and so um, the the forms when forms were added in HTML two, I think that's when uh, the web went from really sort of a traditional hypermedia system, like the the old school documents, like the the, the way the web kind of grew up was it was uh it was more of a document oriented system and when this form came along it was sort of like a spark that made it possible now to build app web what we today call web applications um and i i, I don't know how much thought went into that of like how revolutionary that was <laughs> i mean i um, remember really... at the time it happened it was it was exciting because like going behind the scenes as to what happens like when a post request happens is the the contents yeah. of that form get sent to your server yeah. and then at that point you can run any program you like do anything yep. you like and send back a response and so i remember yeah. it was like an exciting time for the internet yep. because suddenly you, you could compute on yeah. on these things yeah, it really it converted the web from a document, uh, you know, a, a document based, like kind of like Gopher. And I go, and Gopher wasn't a great example, but <laughs> th there were a bunch of these sort of document oriented hypermedia systems that were around, even, you know, uh, low, just purely local ones. Um, but when once you got forms, then now you have a distributed application architecture and now and, and not necessarily a good one in many ways, but but had some real big advantages to it. The, the primary one being that there was this sort of universal client, the browser that was available everywhere. And so to give your application to people, you just had to give them a URL and that was it. And that's, yeah. you know, that's one of the that's one of the well, reasons why the Web despite all the problems with it, uh, has, has done so well. Yeah. Well, let's talk about those like limits or constraints or whatever. So I'll, mm -hmm. I will, you, you identified them and you list them in the book, um, yeah. very eloquently. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and tell you what you told me. So, so <laughs> some key limitations here of, of, of these interactive affordances. Okay. Number one, mm -hmm there are only two types of things that can interactively generate a request. One is the anchor tag. Yeah. Uh, yep. The second is the form. Uh, number yep. two, anchor tags can only call get request. Um, yep. Forms can uh, only call a get or a post request. So they're pretty limited yep. in what they can do. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so they're limited in terms of the elements. Then they're limited in terms of like what, what interaction can cause uh, a request. And so uh, in this case, only clicking a link or clicking a button can cause a request. So things like scrolling, a, you know, moving a slider, scrolling something into view, typing on the keyboard. Right. Um, and then I think perhaps the the one I found most interesting, because it just seemed such a um, such an Im obvious implicit thing to me, I'd never realized it was a constraint, is that when you click on a button, you know, yeah, uh, or or a link, the, yep. the the information that comes back from the server, there's only one thing that the browser can do with it, which is to replace yep. the entire web page. 
Although in this case, yeah. it looks like maybe Richard Stallman's <laughs> <laughs> site search button actually doesn't work. But uh, oh yeah, here it comes eventually. So and well, what you what you just saw there is one of the problems with the web, right? There was no visual before, like the the browsers mm. have actually gotten much worse at this, telling you, hey, something's going on. Like wait, <laughs> yeah. So right? the result came back so from the browser, and. The result of that, in fact, I guess we could do the same thing we did before, right? Which is we can um, go into our network tab. And if I refresh yeah. this, it should be an option to refresh the post request. Um, yeah. And we should be able to see it. Here it is. So yeah. there's the post request. And yeah. the request headers include, uh, you know, various things, but I guess the interesting one is the payload, which is the form data. Yep. The response then comes back, which is HTML. That's the body yep. of the response. And so the mm -hmm. server, yeah, tell us about what happened then really on the server when it received this HTTP yeah, post request. So the server received that post request. HTTP is a very simple network format. Um, if you've done it, if you've ever studied any sort of networking at all, it's very simple. Um, and uh, so the, those name value pairs were encoded in the body that was sent up. Um, and so one of the one of those values was the search term. And then on the back end, there's some program that executes and figures out which pages have that term that you've passed up on it and then constructs URLs to link to them and then presents that beautiful search <laughs> result that we saw. Uh, in the in the screen and it's sort of a full page thing and there um, I noticed that they did not use the a, a very common first of all they used a post rather than a get and arguably yes. that's not correct because for a search you're not you're not asking it to uh, to, mut not doing to mutate anything mm. and so uh, you you probably would uh, using a get would actually make like the the uh, the input values would end up in the URL and then you would have a copy and pasteable search uh, URL and so forth. And so um, I noticed that they also didn't do a redirect. So when you hit refresh, you saw another post yes. and uh, depending on exactly what the post does, that can be a bad thing, right? Like sure. if it buys a ticket, you know, it could buy another ticket. So sure. um, it's, you know, just, this is sort of like the old school gronky web that we're looking at. Yeah. Here. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So this is the thing that blew my mind, Carson, is that, you identified these four specific constraints of what a web browser can do. And those constraints sure. are determined by the specs themselves. Right. And somehow, and we'll come back to how later, I don't know how, but somehow you realized or asked the question, what happens if we remove these four constraints? A. Right. You realized that we can using JavaScript and then yep. with the right script, it's almost like a polyfill for the browser. It's almost like saying, let's pretend the browser didn't have those constraints. And like, so right. just adding a single script tag, it's like, okay, now the browser doesn't have those constraints. <laughs> and so yeah. th that is HTMX, right? HTMX yep. is like the polyfill where we say, let's pretend the browser doesn't have those constraints. And so yeah. you have then a bunch of examples here um, right. such as click to load yep. and it is still, uh, let's find it here. Okay. So you've got a table, right? Yep. Um, and in this table, when I load more agents, bump, it loads more agents and it did not refresh yep. the screen. It didn't. Um, yeah. And you know, the actual button here which is in the last row of the table. Uh, well, yep. we've, got, we've got a new one now, but here we are in the last row of the yep. table. Yeah. Is... Good old call span, good old center tag and call span three. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Here it is. Now you're yeah. not, you know, this button, it's, you know, it's not in a form. It doesn't no. do a submit. Um, yeah. It's like, but it's all still just HTML. And yeah. on these examples, I love that I can actually click show and it actually yeah. shows me the http request that happened right the http yep. response that happened yeah. and so we've got something that looks 
in a lot of ways a lot like Richard Stallman's website. Yeah. Um, but it behaves like a modern, right. uh, you know, SPA style app. So I guess like yeah. I was thinking like, well, maybe we should like, how do you think this is best to explain? But like, how is it like, what are the constraints that we've kind of removed here and how is removing sure. those constraints in this case, allowing this right. button to do this thing? Cause to do, do some magic. Yeah. And actually maybe before we do, I'm going to just switch over to a version where we get to see the server. And sure. of course I then get to show off fast HTML, which is a like an extremely simple wrapper, largely around the genius of Carson's work and also the ah, genius no, of something called on. ASGI. <laughs> um, and, uh, the details don't matter, but here, this is basically says, this is a route. So when you go to yep. slash call get, it's going to return a table with a table header with name, email, and ID, a table mm -hmm. body with five copies of making a row, which has an agent mm -hmm. and a null.org and an ID. And at the right. bottom, it's going to have that button that we saw. Yep. Um, and so if we run this, so I think it's kind of fun looking at it on the server because we can now see the server yeah. running. So if I go there, you can see yep. something looking pretty similar. And I just do one at a time, load another agent, click. Sure. Click. Yep. And yeah, it's, it's actually calling when I click this button, mm -hmm. it's actually calling more. Mm -hmm. And more is just returning, you know, another row plus yeah. add row. And another so button. if we look at the yep. network tab, when we click load another agent, we can see more. And it looks very similar. It's a get request. It's to a URL. Yep. It's got headers. Um, yep. But the response is pretty weird looking. <laughs> So yeah, where do you want to start? How do we how do we learn about how these? Uh... Well, um, let's go look at the let's go look at the button. Look, look, I think you can just inspect it, and we can go through each of the attributes on it. So um, basically, HTMX consists of attributes that you put into your HTML because that's how HTML has worked. You know, you use attributes to specify network interaction behavior, and uh, here there's three attributes: so HX get, HX target, and HX swap. So they've all and, got an uh, the, HX dash on the front. So does that mean yeah. all of the stuff you're adding is always going to be have this prefix? Yeah, just... yeah. We use the HX prefix to namespace it effectively. Okay. You can also some people prefer using data dash HX because mm -hmm. that's more that's in spec. Um, but I've been told by the browser people that this will never break a browser. So. Um, so I like the shorter version of it, Me but, too. um, what HX, HX gets says it's effective, effectively the same as, um, um, href it's saying, here's a URL that I want you to interact with. Like here's a, here's a hypermedia endpoint that I want you to interact with. And that endpoint is then specified as slash more, um, which you've set up a handler for. In fact, yeah, so HTML. let's just take a look at that. So here's my more. So when, yep. yeah. So when somebody clicks this button. It's going to yeah. send a, a get request, request to right. and a get request since it's HX get. And now I get, yep. and this is the thing that I find a lot of people don't understand. People are like, are you using PyScript or Wasm or like, how are you getting right. Python in the browser? And it's like, <laughs> we're not. This is running no. on the server. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, everything's it's it's much it's much more like the traditional web application where your HTML, I don't want to say it's dumb necessarily, but it's it's just everything's specified in terms of what I would call uh hypermedia interactions rather than in terms of, you know, sort of programmatic interactions um, where you're consuming an API and building stuff sort of locally in the browser. Um so that first attribute HX get is specifying sort of where to send the request to and how to send it. So you can do HX post if you wanted it to be a post for some reason or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but HX get makes sense here. Um, and then the next attribute is HX target. And this is really, I think, uh, this gets at that last element of the most uh, important one, I think. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I agree. I think it's the most important one. Um, what this lets you do is say, okay, 
you're going to get back some HTML from this slash more URL from this request, this get mm -hmm. request you make to that URL. Mm -hmm. Where do you want me to put it? <laughs> so and, normally it'd just uh, be like, just replace the whole page. And right. they call that that's a full the, a full page refresh. That's the normal. Full, exactly. So that and that's what links and forms do by default in HTML. By default, um, and so this allows you to say, okay, when that HTML comes back, I want you to put it here. I want to. Put, okay. I want and you to put here it here. It is. Here is hash replace me. So you're using yeah. the CSS selector syntax there. Yeah, exactly. So we decided to reuse the CSS select just it's universal. Nice. People understand it. Pretty yeah, we well. do. Um, and uh, so that tells that tells. HTMX where to put the content that comes back from the server. And then um, the the next attribute, which is HX swap, tells HTMX how to place it. So um, in this case, we want to replace the entire table row with two new table rows. Right. Um, and so that that and so uh, there were the two new table. Actually, maybe we should just look yeah. at that network tab again to see the two yeah. table rows. Yeah. Yep. Um Okay, so here's the response we get back. There's the table row for the yeah. new agent, and there's just a copy of right. basically the one we just saw. Yeah, same button, right? And it's it's going to replace same that ID. same same element and so forth. Yep. Um, and so uh, you know what what the, this this new HTML is now going to replace the entire existing table row, and so that's what because you, that's what you of see visually. This. Because of that, and that's going to replace the entire thing. Now, there's there are other options. So, for example, you could say, well, "I don't want you to one. replace." Let's use one now, because actually, sure. I think we could like simplify this a little, right? If we sure. took the table, and if we yep. gave the table an ID, okay, so we give that there, and then like we could yep. just like say, "All right, let's like," can we kind of like do something like this where we just return yeah, you one can... row? And yep. maybe like return it just before the. I would change that to a. Uh, I would change. Let's see. How would I do this? I would. Um, I would make add row no longer in the table. I would put it after the table. Yeah, exactly. So let's just grab the button. Yeah, uh, grab that button here. and move it out of the table. And let's just <laughs> pop it. You do that. Exactly. Okay. And so we don't need add row anymore. And we can take the ID off of it. Okay, that yeah, makes sense. T head, T body. Body. I kind of like these little lines that VS Code can add. So you can kind of see this is where the T yeah. body is. I thought that okay. seemed like a reason. I would put it on the T body. T body. Okay. Well, in that case, I'll do that too. Because that's where that's where we're gonna where that's where we're gonna append the thing, right? Ah, okay. All right, we can do that for sure. So okay. we've now got T body, we've got these rows, yeah. add row, ID equals agents. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. Okay. And so now so we don't have an add let's... row anymore. That's easy. Sorry, I'm I'm learning fast HTML as we go. Please, here. absolutely. <laughs> so... Yeah. The interesting thing about fast HTML is because it's a direct mapping, like one-to-one -one mapping. So in yeah. fast HTML, the um it kind of there's a almost unique thing about Python, which is in Python mm. you can have positional and named parameters. And so yeah. here you can see this doesn't have a name. And so you can have as right. many of these as you like, and they become positional right. parameters. So they're children. And then you can have as many of these as you like. And as you can see, these are uh, named uh, keyword arguments and they become attributes. Right. So it's kind right. of like the mapping between HTML and Python function syntax is almost uniquely it's, perfect. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So now what we want to do is we want to change HX target to be agents because we're going to target that T body with the response. And then um, rather than outer HTML, we're going to, I'm going to have to go look this up, um, HX. Well, and I think I'm going to say um, the, the reference for HTMX is great. I just type HTMX reference and yeah. it's really nice. And here they all are core attributes. Yeah. So, so we want to, we want to, for, if you look at HX swap, we want um, before end. Mm -hmm. That's the terminology that the, the DOM API uses to insert something before, because we want to insert this new row before the end of the T body, not after the T body, but like mm -hmm. as its last child effectively. So mm -hmm. before end is the right HX swap for that, okay. I think. Nice. 
So I think that should work. And now what's going to happen is there we're it is. Yeah. Working. And if we amazing inspect, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> then we should see. I'm always a little shocked when my stuff works. So now we've just got one thing coming back. So I think mm -hmm. this is a great example of like what happened here. So maybe just talk us through uh, this um, revised button here. Well, so we moved it. We moved the button out of what we were replacing. Like previously, we were replacing the button with a new version of itself. And that makes sense when you're doing things like, for example, loading another page, mm -hmm. because you want to update the H you want to update the, the, the URL with like the next page. So when you load the second page, you want the button to then load the third page. And so you want to have a chance to update the URL. So it makes a lot of sense in sort of a click to load more scenario. But here, when we're just like adding new rows, um, to, to a data structure, um, it doesn't make as much sense. You kind of want it, you're hitting the same, URL over and over again. So in that case, why not move the button outside of the target area? Mm -hmm. um, and this is the uh, same. You know, you're just gonna HX same, get, that's yeah, the same. get is, is the same. Um, the target is a little different. We target the T body because that's where we want to put the new content. It's not, yeah, we're we not replacing a parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and then that before end says, okay, when you get a response, I want you to stick it before the end of that T body. So that's the that's the Dom way of saying, like, at the end of the children. <laughs> so I think something that I didn't understand at first is <clears throat> how extremely small the surface area of what HTMX touches is, you know, and it's basically mm. the core attributes. And there's also, I'm just having a look. Uh, yeah. There's a few more here. Well, some of them are yep. really obvious, like, oh, this is just the same thing, but a different verb. Yeah. Um, yep. Almost none of those I've used. So I can say confidently, this is basically the surface area that normal people like me need. Yeah. And then, like you kind of said, the even the contents of them are, like, copied and pasted, like, to, to the name, the semantics, everything to, like, how the mm -hmm. DOM works. So it's, like, this right. kind of, like, very direct mapping and even then you've right. also like got two versions of swap for OOB or not, two versions of select yep. OOB or not. So there's like, yeah. it's a very small little set of stuff to know. And when you yeah. know the basics of how the browser and the web works, it's supernatural. Yeah. That's my experience <laughs> with it. It well, I think it it rhymes really well with the web. Like it goes yeah. with the grain of the hypermedia infrastructure. And so, if you're familiar with and comfortable with that, which, as you pointed out, a lot of younger people aren't. A lot of younger web developers, I should say, yeah. um, aren't. Um, yeah. Then I think it can come across as being very foreign. You know, so mm -hmm. I think that's why you see some of the misunderstandings around. HTMX, just like, oh, this yeah. is terrible. Like, why would you yeah. do this? Everything has to be a network request. Well, not yeah. everything. But, yeah. Um, so I and think also, it, like, it's you know, not, it's also like surprisingly fast because the kind of full page refresh, I think often it feels slow and it is slow. It feels slow because yeah. you see the whole thing flashing and changing. Right. And it is slow because it requires like the browser reparsing the CSS and rehandling any JavaScript and Right. relaying everything out but when you just yep. insert so this is what i noticed you know when i was showing um the ceo of Vercel this you know and he was trying mm -hmm. it out and particularly yeah. because like Vercel has this kind of edge caching thing working right and he was just like typing and hit enter and it's like boom 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 he's like his mind was blown he didn't you know he was <laughs> like i didn't know this is what a hypermedia yeah. application can feel like yeah, it can feel really good. And the browsers are very good at displaying hypermedia. <laughs> Some would argue that's what they're designed to do. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I think, yeah, the, you know, obviously parsing like little bits of HTML, uh, that's something the browser is incredibly fast at and inserting it into the DOM is also very fast. Yeah. Um, and so if you're not trying to do a bunch of like reconciliation logic, um, like a lot of uh, SBA libraries do, you can be very fast. You do, you are, you know, to an extent you are more dependent on network, like network latency. Um, like if so, you're in Australia. So I have the worst like of it, it, right? Because I'm using American, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. servers and I'm in Australia. And so the speed of light basically means our ping is 70 milliseconds yeah. plus. Right. And I gotta say, yeah. it's not bothering me. Can we yeah. like, 
can we pick another one maybe? So we've looked at like, okay, the, what's maybe the most important, which is you can arbitrarily update the DOM of the existing page just by passing back an HTTP response. Um, maybe another yeah. one to talk about then would be like, we can uh, respond to events other than clicking something. Is there a good sure. example here for... I'm going to always point at active search as being the, well, we could do lazy right. loading or we could do active search. We'll do Which one sounds, we'll do okay, both. Okay, so here's active search. So and this is, I have to say, this is, yeah. So it's like, like, a, like AES a is what I always do. Yes. Okay, and I didn't hit yeah. enter. So no. I'm just typing backspace, backspace. Yep. A. Yeah. And let's have a look. We've got, so I've typed five things. It resulted in five requests. Yep. Um, and so now, interestingly, it's obviously done some debouncing because I typed AES fast enough. It just sent one request. And then I started typing yeah. backspace, wait, yep. backspace, wait. This time I typed it slower. And so I can see it's basically, it looks very normal from what you've described so mm -hmm. far. We've got a post, it's got some data. We yeah. got this response. So should I look at this in element to see how it um, works. I would I would go up and we can look at the highlighted code. It's a little easier to explain uh, if you sure. go up to the top there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, just zoom in a bit. So this is that's a obviously a pattern people are familiar with from like Google and like a, a lot of more advanced web apps. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I called it Active Search. Um, I think I forget what Google calls it, but um, and this is achieved with four HTMX attributes, really three plus one we'll talk about at the end. But um, we once again have an HX post. Here we have HX post instead of HX get because we're issuing a post. I, in an ideal world, this should be a get, but I won't go into the reasons. Why and we don't need to here. see the the, the mm. server side code for this, but like it's pretty obvious yeah. what it would do. It would take the from right. data, it would do the yep. search, and it would return the HTML yeah. that we just saw. Yeah, exactly. And really the big the big difference here, the thing that's new here for for uh people who are watching this and have never done any have never seen HTMX before, is this HX trigger attribute. And uh what that HX trigger attribute specifies is the event that's going to trigger uh, a request. And so it's the event that we use as input. Um and then there's a couple of modifiers on that input. The first one is changed. Well, let's just go which, back. So tell me what is the event? Input, is that a yep. normal uh, DOM event input, that a JavaScript yeah. programmer knows? Yeah, exactly. Input is a is a standard DOM event that you can look up like on M, uh, Mozilla on MDN. Um, and uh, it basically corresponds to a key up, but when it's it's when when the input changes in an, in, in, in an input of some mm -hmm. sort. Um, so it's gonna be triggered by checkboxes, like when you check them and uncheck them. Um, with text boxes, it's triggered whenever the text changes. And this and is something I really like about HTMX is mm. when I want to know how to do something, you know, and it's nearly always like, oh, well, this is just doing this DOM thing. Then the mm -hmm. doc then the document I search is like, you know, uh, Mozilla Web Docs. Yeah. You know, it's, not like, it's not like, oh, right. here's the special dashboard right. abstraction that Carson wrote yeah. or whatever. It's just right. like, no, it's just the web, man. Yeah. Yeah. I tried very much to lean on existing ideas. So, you know, again, as you pointed out, the, the HX swap attribute uses the standard DOM name. Like they're not the names I would pick, but I just figured, you know, we might as well stick with as much as possible with what the standards are. Yeah. Um, and so and we've tried to do the same thing with fast HTML, you know, like I say, like, okay. we, you know, there's a lot of people who have tried a thousand different functional yeah. um, HTML builders. And I thought like, well, you know, H HTML is kind of XML, they're tags, they right. have a name, they have positional pr parameters, they're called children, they have keyword yeah. arguments, they're called attributes. Python has those things. So I just use yeah. those things. You know, it's kind of like, right. I think this thing of like embrace the technology you're working with is right. a theme that I think we're both going for here. Yeah, like I, I like the term rhyming, you know, I like make it, it rhyme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't know, but that just appeals to me. So in any okay. event, yeah, so, so input, input is a, it's a standard event and it could be any event, you know, you could even use, and people do do this. You can use custom events to trigger requests if you I want, have done you know, that. it's like, very helpful. Um, and, and, and you could delete all this. This is like a bit of extra 
yeah. extra coolness. But all, all you actually need to make this work is just this one word. Correct. Yeah. And so the, the next two things are modifiers for that event. And so there's the changed modifier and then the, the, uh, the, the delay modifier. And uh, the change modifier tells HTMX only issue a request if the value of this input has changed. Um, so you don't want to, like if someone hits an arrow key, for example, that's not a reason to issue a new request. Um, and then the delay, you noticed that there was some sort of debouncing going on yeah. and that's what that delay colon 500 milliseconds is doing. Yeah. That's saying basically when an input occurs, wait 500 milliseconds. And if another input hasn't occurred, issue the request. Yeah. Otherwise just reset the timer. So Carson, speaking as like a, a, a user, something that I like a lot about this, but at first made me nervous is a yeah. lot of the code I saw, including on your website had yeah. like a lot of unfamiliar words in unfamiliar sure. syntax. And I thought, I'm not clever enough to understand this. But then right. I quite quickly realized like, or you can delete most of them and it still works. Right. The bits I yeah. recognized, which is like respond to this event, are like a fine. Right. And so I actually yeah. found it suited me quite well to gradually learn these extra bits and your yeah. book is great at this. So the entire first section is about web 1.0. You have a application right. scratch. All of section two is about HTMX and you introduce right. it like super gently, you know, right. um, and just one little bit at a time. So, you know, I would encourage people to just go through this book and then the other thing to say is the mapping between, just like the mapping between HTML and fast HTML functions is a simple one-to-one -one mapping. The mapping between mm. uh, um, HTMX attributes and fast HTML attributes is also a one-to-one -one mapping. You right. just literally replace the hyphen with an underscore. Right. Um, yeah. So like, you know, Folks could go through, I think folks should go through this book and build applications. And if you're a Python programmer, you don't have to learn any JavaScript. But in the process, you'll be learning a little bit about, you know, JavaScript things and HTML things like yeah. out of HTML. But, you know, this book is a really great way to gradually build up to understanding these like optional extras, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, no, I, it, it's always tough to balance like, you know, you want to you want to be useful for the advanced users, but not too hard on the new users and so forth. So it's uh, it is tough. I do think the book is uh, uh, pretty good at, at making it a general introduction. I, I appreciate so. you saying that. Um, so and then uh, there's a comma in there and yeah. then there's a, so the events are comma separated. So there's also a search event. OK, so here's uh, and, search, this is event number one which is yeah. uh, an input event, but only if it changed and only if there hasn't been one within 500 milliseconds. Yeah. And this is like, or. Yeah, or, or this a event. search event. What the hell is a search event, event? Search event is triggered, uh, for example, uh, scroll down to the UI. Um, so wh what browser are you using? You're using Chrome. Okay, see yeah. that little X on the side there? Yeah. When you click that, a search event occurs. <laughs> ah. I don't know. An input may also occur there. I need to look, actually, because it was. Yeah, and that's because so. like there's a lot of stuff in HTML nowadays, including this yeah. type equals search. Yeah, exactly. Input. And so, um, so that search and there's, I think there are other like keyboard shortcuts. I don't know the details of it, but we felt like, okay, we, we're going to, we're going to issue a request on the search event as well. And like, um, I just so. showed an example here. So, um, we use this thing by default. You, you can use whatever uh, styling you like, but by default, we use this thing called Pico, which I'm sure you're yeah. familiar with. Um, oh, yeah. And one of the things I like about Pico is it really leans in also to the idea of like just embrace, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the the web. And yep. so here's a rather nice, reason, you know, reasonably nice looking search box. Um, right. And as you can see, it's, an import with type equal search yep, and a button, you know, and in fact, the source code for this is literally form role yep. equal search. Yep. 
Uh, so yeah. yeah, I think by like embracing the stuff that's available in HTML and then joining it together with things, other things that embrace that, like Pico and like HTMX, yeah. we can have very kind of, I don't know, it feels like the stuff you learn as you put this together all joins up together. It's very right. different to learning yeah. like this dashboarding system and right. now if you want to use a different dashboarding system, throw away everything yeah. and start again, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I I think that's a good thing about HTMX and Pico CSS is a great library as well. Um, and that it's just, it, 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 it does, you know, again, rhyme with like, and tries to reuse the existing concepts of the web or other than imposing a bunch of new sort of mental categories on top of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, okay. So either search or input. All right. And then yeah. target we've seen. So the search results, yeah. and this is a kind of a common pattern that I guess we see with HTMX is you yeah. kind of start off generally, let's just like close, let's just refresh this. You kind of start off with, uh, So you've got a table, if you open that table up, there's a table body in there that's got nothing in it, but it has exactly. that ID on it. Yeah. And so we're targeting that 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 T body and uh, the default swap is gonna be inner HTML. So what HTMX is gonna do is mm -hmm. take the response that comes back and then put it inside of that element. And so, okay, that, so that works for this situation. That just makes sense. Um, so. But yeah, that's the that's the idea there. Um, and then there's that last attribute, which is kind of a new one, the HX indicator. And I that, haven't used um, this yet, but people rave about okay. it. Okay. Yeah, you use that. It takes a CSS selector, and uh, that you can point it at uh, an element, and it'll basically show that element while the request is in flight. And that addresses that issue you saw on Richard Stallman's web page, where you click the button, and it seemed like nothing happened. <laughs> for a second because it was oh i see that little searching stuff. thing popped up for yeah a moment. and so, if, so you, fast, yeah, if you, you can't look, really see it but yeah yeah i always say so sometimes i make this slower so that like people yeah. can see the indicator yeah and then people complain that htmx is slow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. and then i speed it up and then they don't see the indicator so i don't know but um okay great but I, yeah let's that's, that's what that's there for um do you have a hard stop at some time i'm just trying to think how much time to spend on different things I don't, I okay. can talk. As so long let's as look at uh, the lazy loading one then, um, if yeah. that's okay. So yeah. here's our demo, Tokyo Yeah, climate. so hit, hit refresh, hit refresh. Okay, refresh. And you'll see like, uh, this is uh, a big indicator. And then I see. So if I scroll with, let me just, I think I understand. So if I make this smaller. Yeah. And then I do that. And then I scroll to it. I see it's kind of happening in the background and yeah okay cool so the reason for that is if i wanted to like have something i could start reading or else something else was busy calculating underneath is that what's happening yeah here? this is a this is a good pattern for when uh you have some some information that is uh maybe even even if it's important it's something that you don't want to block the rendering of the first render of the page you don't want it to block that first load of the page because it's mm. going to take a while mm. so this is just a i mean it's just a dumb image like but it's a stand in for okay here's some complicated stuff mm. that we did to compute you know tokyo's climate or whatever yeah um and uh so uh the, the important thing here is that the rest of the page renders very quickly it sure does um yeah. and then uh and then we can issue this request um, sort of when the page loads to to sort of uh, have a secondary request that's going to bring in the expect uh, the expense of computation. So uh, looking at this div, um, we want to once again have an HX get where we we're going to issue a request to a URL that's going to may presumably take a while because it's expensive. And now this um, presumably would be re basically returning. An image tag or like a div with an image tag. An image tag like or whatever. Yeah, whatever. And then that'll get whatever loaded into wherever the target is. Yeah. And actually, and I guess in this case, the, the target is itself. I guess. Yeah, the target, since we don't specify a target, the default target is going to be the div itself. And just and, to come back to your last thing, you said also that the default swap is the inner HTML. So that inner HTML. this is going to be swapped out. Exactly. Okay. And then the trigger here is load. And that is, uh, unfortunately, that is not a standard um, but I just, I couldn't resist making a specific <laughs> uh, uh, event called load. Okay, so um, you've for, got HTMS events here, and yeah. uh, we can scroll through them to see there's quite a few events, yeah. and here is yeah. load. 
Yeah, it's this is actually if you go to the docs, it's not. I don't think it's this is a this is triggered when an element is loaded, but um, it's in the docs I mentioned. Uh, and if you go and look uh, on uh, hmx.org/docs, uh huh. Um, there's a there's a section okay. on events. Oh, actually, well, if I go to trigger, I guess that would be the best way. Yeah, it's it. probably in there as well. Yeah, there's a couple of special ones in there. Cool. So I'll just uh, search for load. Here we are, non-standard yeah. events. Great. Yeah. So we have load, we have revealed and intersect. Um, revealed, and like, have you ever worked with the intersection observer in JavaScript? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I, the, the, the way JavaScript handles sort of like things scrolling into view, it's pretty complicated. Um, and I wanted a declarative API. And so I just kind of put, and the same with loading, you use this, I forget the name of the event. It's a big, ugly name. And so for these three things, I was like, look, I'm just going to have like my own obviously named events for this stuff. Great. And we'll, we'll just have to deal with it. And so, okay, like, so I just write to make sure I kind of clarify both for myself and for other people, I just confused. There's two... Are these two different load events, HTMX colon load versus yeah. this load? Yeah. What, what are H the... mm -hmm. Anything that starts with HTMX colon is an event that HTMX itself triggers mm -hmm. as a custom event. Yes. These are these these three events are synthetic events that HTMX makes work as I if see. they were real DOM events. Okay. They're I've not used real, HTMX not real... colon load before. Yeah. Um, yeah. because like I like to set up things so that Yep. When I'm working with a JavaScript library, that when sure. HTMX adds something to my page, the JavaScript library yep. can run on that as well. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it's useful for. So eh, maybe not the best name in the world, but it is what it is. Okay, well, this is pretty um, straightforward then, isn't it? So you've got this div, it's it uh, targeting itself. And when it's yeah, when load is done, it's going to go ahead and stick the graph in sure. here. Yeah, exactly. And that's so this can be very a very good way. Like if you have a part of a web page that is expensive to compute and it's making that web page, the first paint of that web page very slow, you can just move that that chunk out to a new URL and then use this pattern. And then suddenly that web page will load very quickly. Nice. And you know, the the other stuff will come in when it's ready, but the user can still interact with the page. They can still click on links or if they get sick of waiting or whatever, they're not stuck there waiting. Like we were for that search result on Stallman's page, just wondering when this was ever going to come yes, back. Right. So. Exactly. So, um, okay, great. I uh, I wanted to just maybe show folks um, how then all this works together um, with like. CSS and JavaScript and and all that stuff because that, like something sure. else that I found interesting is how the fact that HTMX removes those four constraints mm -hmm. doesn't really impact at all how I use styles or JavaScript, you know. Right. Um, so like, I'll, I'll just share a couple of things you know, to maybe make that more clear for folks. Um, so for instance, and the other thing I found interesting, Carson, is like combined with fast HTML and also combined with this really um, nice deployment service we've been using called Railway, where you can mm -hmm. run as many things as you like and they cost two or three cents a month, you know, mm -hmm. unless lots of people are hitting them. And so there right. was this interesting thing where I wanted to create this little mini page, you know, where I talk about things like HTMX and HTTP and right. memes and stuff. And right. I, what was wild to me as I started doing this was I was like realized I kind of created this thing which has like all these like little things like this auto updating kind of right. Aside and like things that wave over when you go over them and that go bold, but it's like, oh, like some blogging content framework. And I'm like, actually, no, you know, this is just a fast HTML page. Um, right. The source code for this page is like 
<laughs> you know, it's just marked down with like a tiny right. bit of code. And right. all the work happens actually in Bootstrap, you know? Right. And so like with with Bootstrap, um, you know, I was able to basically create this tiny little thing for this page. Uh, when I probably guess sure. here. Um, called like a bootstrap page, you know, so overview yeah. basically says return a bootstrap page. It's page number zero. So that's why it knows which one to make bold. This is the title of it. These are the sections. And like there's all these nice little things in HTMX. Like if you return right. a title tag as one of your partials, it actually changes the yeah. title of the page, which is sweet. Yeah. You know, yep. yeah, what, like what's a section? Well, section is just like, you know, just a div. You know, yep. uh, with so like all the CSS is just really normal, and then mm -hmm. like the JavaScript, and I think this is the bit people get the most confused about, is also really normal. So um, if you look at, you know, that we we have uh, fast HTML .js. For example, mm -hmm. for, for Markdown, if you create, have a marked class on anything, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. uh, basically add a Markdown JS component to your page, mm -hmm. then it runs a bit of JavaScript, and now all of your Markdown right. is automatically done. Or, you know, you can do the same thing for Highlight yeah. to get syntax highlighting. Or, oh, right. one of my favorite ones that, that you do. Sortable. Sortable. Yeah, now, this one, cool. like, actually... I much prefer my version because it's less clever than yours. Um, ah. so it's much easier to see. This is my version of sortable. That's the entire thing yeah. is you're just okay. called sortable create. Okay. And so. Um, it's you know, down there, drag and drop. Yeah. Maybe. You end up with this, uh, it, this ability to drag and drop. And the cool thing yep. is that behind the scenes, it's telling the server what the new order is. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, this like, is a, yeah, go on. This is a great example. Like, you know, sometimes I've heard a lot, especially now that HMX is getting more and more popular and the JavaScript community can't ignore it anymore or make fun of it like they used to, yeah. is people will say things like, oh, HMX is for people who hate JavaScript. And there's some truth to that. Obviously, if you're not a big JavaScript fan, HTMX can give you a lot of oomph. Um, but also to really to take advantage of HTMX, like the the events, the fact that it uses events and integrates like with the DOM via events means that um, it should be able to play very well with JavaScript. Well, let's look at it, right? Ways, so like, let's yeah. run this little, so I've got this kind of like idiomatic app I've created with like most of its comments, you know? And right. so like, here, you know, here's the bit, here's the bit that makes, makes it drag and drop, mm -hmm. um, describes how that happens. And so if we run it, and then I say like, okay, let's show prioritization, drag it to the bottom. Right. Oh, oh, missed, drag it to the bottom. There we go. And if I now refresh, it's still at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, um, and magic. yeah, it's magic, you know, and, and like the, and like, how does that work? Is like I think this is really interesting. It's like okay, well we include this library, which as we described yep. is literally three lines of code. And I added this tiny thing, Carson, which is yep. just a little JavaScript thing that just basically does a HTMX for each on load kind of thing. So it, it uh, right. both causes this to happen on all new things as well. And then sortable. It's kind of amazing how all these things you made just come together. So we we have a form. Yeah. And so the to-do list itself is actually inside a form. And so that form is triggered by the event that the sortable docs say yeah. is triggered, which is the end event. Yeah. I didn't yep. have to do anything. And then it just nope. calls <laughs> slash reorder. Yep. And then reorder is two lines of code. You know, it updates yep. each to-do to the new priority and returns, and this is the reason my code's simpler than yours is because it's less efficient. I return the whole to-do list, <laughs> you know. Which is fine. Yeah, yeah, I've got no problem with that. So, Sometimes yeah, that's the right thing. JavaScript is like, such a delight in HTMX yeah. because I only have to use it for the bits I need it for, you know. Right. 
And that's so, I, you know, I say HTMX is pro JavaScript because of that, for that very reason, it, it takes the pressure off of JavaScript to be the entire infrastructure for your web app. And so it can be used for these situations where it really can add a lot of value. So drag and drop is something that's not baked into the web out of the box, at least not well by default. And so these, you know, sortable JS addresses that and provides some really good functionality. And then HTMX can integrate with it via events really cleanly. So um, a really good, that's a, another great example, um, uh, I think of HTMX being, being used the way it was intended to and sort of playing well with other things. You know, it's designed to be, especially with it's a focus on events, um, it's designed to plug in reasonably well with other libraries, as long as they, you know, as long as they play well with the DOM to triggering events and then using inputs to communicate information out to, to the remote systems. So let's switch topics a bit if we can. And sure. the reason that I, or a reason I use so much unappreciated epithet genius <laughs> is because mm. There, most things that I come across and I say, like, that's clever, I can immediately think, like, oh, I see exactly how they came up with that, you know. But, like, right. my friend Chris Latner, for example, who's created, like, LLVM and Mojo yeah. and Swift and other things, like, very often I have conversations with him where he describes the thing he's created. Having described right. the thing, I can see, like, yes, that is the right way to do that. And then right. I'm like, but I don't know how you could possibly have known that. I only know it now that you've told me. Yeah. Now, this thing you've done, right. bit like there yeah. are four constraints. We can remove them with a polyfill. Once we do that, yep. we can reprogram the web. Like, right. where did that come from? Because, like, this goes back to, like, <laughs> like 10 years plus ago that you kind of yeah. first implemented this. And I yeah. hadn't, I've not seen it before. Yeah. I mean, there were, you know, there was a, there was something called PJAX back in the day. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of PJAX. I did hear of um, it, yeah. There, yeah, there was PJAX. Um, and then there was a, in jQuery, there was this, I think it's called fetch or load, load. I think it's load. Um, and uh, it does something similar. You give it a, you, you just give it a CSS selector, like in the dollar sign syntax, and then you say dot load and you give it a URL and it'll issue a get and just load the response into that thing. Yep. Um, and so there, there were some, there were some little things like that floating yeah, around. Well, I, we're, at and, Fastbell, we were one of the first jQuery users when it first came out okay. actually. And so we, it was go. fun to watch those things kind yeah. of get added and definitely Rising, yeah. Rising's a genius, you know, yeah. for sure. Yeah. He's a, uh, oh yeah. Um, and so I think like, you know, I saw that I, I've told the story before, but I was just having trouble with a performance issue. I was trying to do sorting in JavaScript in like 2009 or eight. And it just was too slow because the run times at that time were so slow and non-standard and all the rest of it. And so DOM manipulation was very slow. And uh, I ended up, I, I don't know if I used the jQuery.load method but i did something i think i might have seen it and did something similar and then kind of started making that more general using the jquery ajax function um where you know i was like oh yeah i didn't so i had a, a ui i was trying to sort it was too slow to do in javascript and out of desperation i tried doing it on the server side and then just slamming it into the UI and that turned out to be really fast. Like to, to my surprise, it was a pretty desperate move on my part. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it well, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. but but it worked. And yeah. I was like, oh, this is great. Okay, and I didn't know you were allowed to do that. <laughs> you can just put right, you know, you can put HTML wherever you want. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, and then so that turned into like a little function that I had for a while that was kind of more in the jQuery style of like you look things up and hook in functionality. Um, and then I saw Angular one. Um, yes. And I didn't like I didn't like much of Angular one, except that they use attributes to specify behaviors. Yeah. And I was like, you know, this is a, this is a lot like like the href stuff. My first like links and <laughs> big hit YouTube video was an Angular. One okay. Yeah. Like yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to throw. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to throw any shade at Angular. I've got no beef with Angular, and it's fine. But it just wasn't what I was looking for in what I was trying to do. Um, but I did like how they used attributes and I realized, okay, I can use attributes to hook this, 
behavior in instead of uh, instead of uh, using a, a jQuery selector. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so that sort of turned into that just very organically turned into intercooler JS. And I've got to be honest with you, like a lot of the academic stuff came afterwards. Yeah, like, I didn't understand hypermedia very well yeah. when I did when I initially did all this stuff. It was just you know, look at that. That doesn't shock me at all. You know, my um, my friend and co-founder Eric Reese wrote this book called mm. "The Lean Startup," which is actually a lot more than just about startups. It, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's his idea of the MVP, and it's actually the right. basis on which Answer AI is created, which is building things that way, which is like iteratively, bit by bit. Mm -hmm. You know, and then later on, you kind of look back and you're like, "Oh, I kind of built something kind of cool here." I yeah. wonder how this thing I built actually works. Right. And then you're like, yeah. oh, I guess it's hypermedia. And I guess there's actually these four constraints. And we actually ended up removing them. And yeah, it's yeah. like, I think it makes it less intimidating to know that you don't have to invent <laughs> this new universe in your head all ahead of time and then implement it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's what's the saying, like, uh, existence brings essence into being like, you have to do the thing first, and then you can talk about what the thing is. <laughs> like, yeah, it's kind of got to be there first. And then you can say, Okay, what what just happened? <laughs> um, but you must have had some so, kind of uh, intuition at some point that there was a direction forming that felt like you were enthused enough about it, you wanted to invest in it. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, to me, it was more just an unwillingness to deal with the complexities of like, you know, knock out JS at the time and, um, oh, yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah, like, yeah. I just, I was like, man, I just don't want to deal with all that. No, I, mean, <laughs> just, I, I just, I just want to be able to put stuff in the DOM. Um, and, uh, you know, I think when I first did it, I went through, there was a, a, a and this is with the intercooler, the predecessor to HTMX, which is very similar. It's just, yeah. it's basically a jQuery implementation of the same stuff that HTMX does. Um, I, I went through and I started doing examples and then I, I started realizing like, whoa, you can do infinite scroll with this. Whoa, you can do active search with this. Like, yeah. this is cool. Like you can do a lot with this. And so that, um, but that was, I discovered that, you know, I didn't yeah. think about that up front. I discovered yeah. the fact that, Hey, with these abstractions, you know, with the, with the limitations on HTML removed, yeah, you can great. actually do a lot of cool stuff. So yeah. it was very organic and I, and not, I definitely not like me thinking things through. <laughs> yeah. So. so, no, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me because I, I'm, I'm sure I've never created anything as clever as HTMX, but I've cr definitely created things that are at least as bloody minded as HTMX, mm. you know, like you've kind sure. of been like, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Knockout, for example, most people listening probably won't remember it, but it was very popular <laughs> back in the day and it, it came yeah. out as, um, as we were building Kaggle, which is one of my earliest startups. And some of the folks were like, we've got to do Knockout. And I was just like, yeah. we just so don't have to do Knockout. <laughs> and yeah, it's interesting you have this reaction to complexity. It's not a reaction mm -hmm. to, like, it's not a kind of classic conservative, like, we have to do things the same way. It's mm -hmm. more like, no, we have to make things accessible and we have to, like, sure. you know, appreciate what's good about what exists and take advantage of that. Right. And, but yeah, it's interesting. Like, I feel like maybe... Like I said at the start of this interview, you don't look or sound like a tech genius. You don't live in a place full <laughs> of tech geniuses. You know, you're, you know. You and I'm also of, not a tech genius, so. You spend a lot of your time. That like, all checks out. <laughs> teaching kids baseball, you know, like, right. uh, you you know, it, and, you know, so I guess, you know, would, I would consider myself an outsider. You know, uh, would yeah. you kind of consider yourself an outsider? And would you say that's part of why you can create these somewhat bloody minded yeah. things that push back against what everybody else is trying to do? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely was an outsider in the Bay Area because I was from Sacramento. And uh, I've, always, I've been like one thing I've, I realized about my my particularly when I was younger is I was very naive about like everything, <laughs> pretty much everything. And, uh, so, uh, the, you know, the problem with being naive is when bad stuff happens, you, you can get pretty embittered. And mm -hmm. so I went through that whole naivety embittered cycle on the Bay area and so mm -hmm. forth. And, um, so, um, so th there's definitely, so this is you people know, who don't know. So Sacramento is like, 
three hours or so inland of San Francisco and it's like it's pretty hot and yeah. pretty <laughs> kind of like it's not it's not at all like San Francisco. But... Yeah, it's very agricultural. Or it was. It's the the Central Valley is filled up because the Bay Area has gotten so expensive. So what I grew up in has been is is very different now the area I grew up in. But um, but yeah, I was just not, you know, I just wasn't a Bay Area person. Um, and I felt that like the entire time I was there, even when I, you know, I went to Berkeley and then Stanford for grad school and just was very much an outsider. Um, and that's fine. Um, I'm also, you know, a little bit of a contrarian, I guess. Uh, and so that, you know, and that's good and bad, you know, it's been good in parts of my life and bad in other parts. Um, but I do think like something you sort of touched on there is, there doesn't in tech tech technology is so forward looking that we don't do a lot of looking back at what people had before right or what was done before um and i think that's one reason why we're constantly reinventing the wheel you know in many ways sometimes worse you know um and uh so uh the with with htmx and with intercooler before that, I really was trying to, once I understood, once I got my feet under myself and understood what was going on is I tried as much as possible to rhyme. You know, that's the way yeah. I would say it is yeah. you don't have to be the past. You don't have to dress or yeah. like, you know, act or whatever, but like, if you can rhyme with that stuff, like there's probably some good ideas there. And I think that's one reason why HTMX has a pretty high power to weight ratio is that yeah. it, it just builds on these really like CSS selectors and like the basic exactly. DOM APIs and, and events like, you know, the, the DOM being an event bus, like that's, those are all concepts that are already there and mm. HTMX really just like is built on top of them. I mean, I so spent, that's why I think I spent months, like the year, year or two ago, teaching people APL a notation okay. originally developed yeah. in the late fifties. Uh, yeah. Like I definitely appreciate this idea of, recognizing yeah. when really deep thoughts have been had in the past and yeah. when you can take advantage of that um, yeah. in the present and combine them with new things. Yeah. It's like, what's a new take on that? You know, that's, that can often be a good, like you, one example I bring up a lot is the visual basic six debugger was like the best debugger oh I had ever God. used. Oh my God, edit and continue, so good. Yeah, you could, it was and like, you could do whatever you wanted. You could drag the program count, like you could drag the pointer wherever you wanted to yep. during execution. It was unbelievable. Yep. And my understanding is .NET has that now, but I work on the JVM a lot and it's got nothing like that, nothing yep. even close. Yeah. And it's like... And if you look <laughs> well, back further... Nice to get back. If you go back further to Microsoft Access, you know, yeah. it, the thing it had with these like reports and stuff was basically yeah. flex grid you know, right. HTML programmable back when yep. I was doing that, I guess, in the early 90s. So yeah. let me just, again, switch then to kind of like talking about um, something which I've seen with you and I've certainly experienced myself. Um, mm. I very intentionally do a lot of things extremely differently to everybody else um, because yeah. I like to experiment with like what happens when you try things differently. So... I'd be able to think sure. called NB Dev, which is where you do all of your software development inside Jupyter Notebooks. And I've written most of my software right. like that for the last few years. And it turns out the affordances provided in notebooks are actually amazing. Uh, right. I've, um, you know, I created an AI thing called Fast AI, which kind of, when everybody was trying to build big foundation models, I was focused on like fine tuning. Um, right. And now with fast HTML, when everybody's focused on Svelte, React, View, whatever stuff, I'm like, let's lean into HTMX and Hypermedia and Python instead of mm -hmm. JavaScript. Um, something I've noticed a lot is, and I, I, I've seen there's a psychological phenomenon where yeah. when human beings are presented with change, Mm -hmm. There's a, like literally a chemical reaction in their brain that is identical to physical pain. Right. Um, and I see that with how people react to HTMX as well, which is I often see people respond with an enormous amount of anger, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. almost like this kind of no. desperate anger. And yeah, I'm kind of like, and so it's interesting how, what, you kind of have these two really different directions. One is like, you're literally a university professor and like you say, expertly Stanford and you create mm -hmm. these like 
incredibly academic things looking back at Rory Fielding and Heat Lewis right. and whatever else. And then there's the other right. Carson, which is like trolling, memeing, you know. <laughs> I guess like, yeah, is it like, is it like partly that you're kind of reacting to the bullshit earnestness of this world and trying to like not take it too seriously or like is it kind of like an intentional thing you're doing to try to deal with the the reaction people are having to this psychological pain of seeing change or you know what what's <laughs> yeah how do you see all this i well so i think you're right um and i'm sympathetic there's a reason we're like that right like there and there's nothing about us that is not there for for some reason or other and so change is hard on humans so we should make you know allowances for that fact um humor if for me i've always been kind of a, a joker and class clown and so forth and um i i grew up on the you know on the forums in the late 90s and early 2000s kind of <laughs> pretty rough and tumble back in the day um and yeah, uh I so i got i got good with memes um, and I've just always preferred joking. It's funny, like, you know, I just, I don't know. Um, I, I end up, uh, <laughs> you know, like a lot of memes. Um, and you know, I think they're, there's, they're good. They're, you know, a, a picture is worth a thousand words and a meme may be worth like a hundred thousand words. Like a good meme can really cut through a lot of, of stuff. Um, and so <laughs> that's, a, that's one, that's one by Alex. That's a pretty funny one. Um, so I really like humor. Um, I, you but know, this when humor I was younger... is so like, it's so on point, like, it, like, it's literally <laughs> what we were talking about. It's like, I, we, it's like, Hey, if you do this stuff, you're just doing the, the foundations <laughs> yeah. and yeah. you keep doing the foundations and they all come together. And suddenly you're like, you're really good at building <laughs> web apps, you know? Yep. And like, yeah. um, you know, Daniel Roy Greenfeld, uh, one of the yeah. co-authors of Two Scoops of Django, which is one of the best programming yeah. books of all time, within yeah. 45 minutes of trying fast HTML, and he'd never also used yeah. HTMX, he had rewritten his entire yeah. blog system. Yeah. You know, uh, his his wife, Audrey, the other of the Two Scoops of Django co-authors, uh, yeah. uh, saw him do that. Uh, the next day she was doing a um, a hackathon she had never used fast okay. HTML before. She decided that yeah. morning that she was going to use it for her team in the hackathon. They won the hackathon. You know, like nice. these people who have like learned yeah. the basics and then they get something that rhymes. Yeah. They they zoom in. But so these yeah. memes, they're like, they're funny, but my God, <laughs> they're like, they're cut yeah. to the bone as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm a pretty good writer. You know, the book, I, I, I was actually better at um, English. Like I, I scored better in standardized tests on on English than I did on math. And I've always just liked, you know, I like I, re, I read a, a, a boatload when I was a kid. And so, I, you know, I just it's just a knack I've got for memes. I don't know. It's not this isn't Shakespeare, but it, it's very effective communication medium. Combining a picture with a, you know with a short and pithy statement. So, um, well, you know. I mean, when I wanted an explanation for HTMX, um, yeah. I, I used to, I used one of the memes cause it, it is, yeah. it, it did a better job of explaining what was in my head right. than I could use words for, which is like, yeah. and actually, so Eric Reese and I were talking about the kind of days of when we were starting coding PHP, You've got a shell home directory, you dump a file in there, you've got a web app mm -hmm. to show to your friends, you know. Yep. And so it was even simpler than like your 2004 model. And, yeah. you know, we were both saying like, oh, you know, it's so painful to create an application now, right. you know. And so, yeah, the picture does tell a thousand words. It, 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 it does. It does. And humor works. People like humor. The people who get mad about them, like they're probably the people that you want to get mad anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't know. It's it's been a good way. I've gotten much better though. Like, you know, if you if you were talking to me ten years ago, I would have been much more embittered about things, like much more sarcastic. You know, there's and there's a part of me that's still like that. I just really, you know, I, I was about it was about ten years ago. I just kind of was like, you know what, I can't live like this. Like I'm not, I've got to be more positive about things. There's a lot of good things. It's so easy to be negative in the, you know, especially with the information overload we have now, 
Um, and I, you know, I, I just was, I just sort of committed to being more positive about it and still does be it funny. Help and, to, and does it help to be yeah. away from the Bay area, you know, living in <laughs> rural Montana? Probably or... it's, there's less financial pressure. Um, that certainly helps. Uh, you know, M Montana is very beautiful and like, there's a lot of nature. Also, you can freeze to death. So that <laughs> gives you some perspective on life. Like, Oh wow, yeah. it's minus 40 outside. I don't have I really problem. hope the power. <laughs> I really hope that yeah, minus 40 Fahrenheit. Uh, I really hope the power doesn't go out <laughs> because that would be bad. Um, so, you know, I, I think that helps. Um, but I think, you know, I, when I look back, I think I could have handled the Bay Area much better than I did um, if I had just been a little bit more, just been more positive. You know, early, early on, it was or early on. What do I want to say? Uh, you know, for a long time to me, people who were sort of Pollyannish were uh, like, I just would, you know, like, oh, that person's just positive no matter what. It's fake. And now I'm much more, I try to be much, I try to be almost fake positive because it's not going to change. So much is not going to change anyways. <laughs> right. So like you get, you know, you can control it. You're like, there's a lot of stoicism. I, I can't handle stoicism because uh, it's often very sort of like m morose and I just can't be like that. So I, I like the more joker approach. I think also like it, like I've always felt like the internet's a big place. You know, and right. I always feel like my my job is not to market my weird shit to other people, but to right. find the other people who appreciate my weird shit and let them <laughs> right. find me. And so then yeah. you end up with a community of people who appreciate your weirdness. Right. And you don't have to spend time trying to convince people to do something they don't want to do. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, I didn't know this was going to work as well as it did. You know, I had... Like a year ago, we basically, you know, we were going to release the book and I, I'd been messing around on Twitter a little bit more. I'd taken some time off Twitter because it just had gotten so crazy. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but I came back and I was like, and I, about a year ago, I, I committed, I was like, okay, I'm going to really like, I'm going to engage on Twitter and I'm just going to go crazy and be like the crazy person <laughs> that I want to be on Twitter and have fun with it. And if that works great. And if it all goes down in flames, also great. Like, I don't care. Right. Um, and I think so, you know, there's probably some authentic authenticity there. Um, but there's also a bunch of risks, like, you know, this could all <laughs> end in tears, probably will. Um, but, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I don't know, I just, I really, I tried, you know, I, I gave that talk at Big Sky DevCon where I talked about trying to be more positive. And I think that's been the big change for me about 10 years ago. I just was like, I'm, I, we, I need to be more positive about things. Yeah. Um, still be a joker, still be myself, but just don't emphasize the negative stuff so much. Don't dwell yeah. on it so much. No, I mean, you can find like, you can be your, continue to be authentic whilst finding different facets. Mm -hmm. to highlight internally and externally for sure yeah yeah <laughs> right we all have those different um, facets right i'm not sure i can recommend what i did for other people but <laughs> it worked it worked this one time anyways um so you know i guess the thing i'd be interested to kind of wrap up on unless there's other stuff you mm. feel like is worth talking about is like the kind of where to now you know, um, it, it, it seems to me you've highlight, you've highlighted how browsers ought to work. I don't right. see any reason they shouldn't work like this. And in fact, if this stuff was built into the browser, you wouldn't probably need the HX dash pieces, you know, maybe some of it could be, have a bit of a streamlined developer right. experience in ways that you couldn't do. Um, I guess like, I mean, not that it feels like it matter hugely to me if, if whether that happens mm -hmm. or not, I don't mind sticking an HTML script to the top of my pages. And in fact, fast HTML right. adds that script header by default, but yeah, right. I guess I'm curious about like, what's, um, what's in your head now? Are you thinking like there's other things I could do with this? Are you moving on to something mm -hmm. else? Are you yeah. feeling like, you know, you're that browsers might actually pick up on some of these ideas, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think, I think we'll, I, I, I know that the browser people are looking at HTMX and are interested in the idea. It's a big process to get anything like that into the browser. Um, 
especially coming from more of an external source than sort of the internal, you know, sources. And um, also the so, most important uh, bit, the fourth one, the like update any part of the DOM that feels like the yeah. bit that would be hardest to... Yeah, analyze. yeah. They, so they, there's, al there's already, a, it's kind of there a little bit. You can actually, there's a target attribute on anchors and forms um, and that takes an ID, but the ID has to be of an iframe. <laughs> So nobody uses it. Right. So there's like there's the infrastructure's there. It's like yeah. almost there. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's I don't think it's a, a too far of a jump. And one of the HTMX team members is working on a more formal proposal to get some of these ideas, not the full HTMX API, but some of these ideas into HTML. Um, and you know, I mean, it could happen. Um, it, that would be a very long term process. Um, I do think HTMX is pretty much done as as far as like what it does and and the API it provides. Um, if new technologies come out in the browser, so for example, the transitions API came out and we integrated that into HTMX. So I would expect to, you know, do do some things like that um, as browser technologies improve. But I, I don't think HTMX is going to change a whole bunch. They're just fixing bugs and you know, uh, improving it. Hopefully, not at, at this point. I want to not ruin it. <laughs> like let's, I'll put it that way. So I'm going to try and keep it pretty stable and people. Yeah, can it doesn't build, feel. You know, I mean, that's kind of partly what I was asking. It feels like. It almost feels like you discovered something, you know. Yeah, totally. Like, and you discovered the thing, and you, you know, and then you totally. showed the people the thing, and then you've written down why the thing's good, and you've provided examples of the thing. And like, yep. yeah, dude, where do you go from here? <laughs> no, <laughs> right. Oh man, what's a well? You know, I've got other projects I work on. There's a uh, you know idiomorph, which is sort of a DOM yes. morphing algorithm that I yes. think was an improvement over the state of the art. Okay, um, well, let's, so let's that... go slowly here. Okay, so HTMX. Mm -hmm idiomorph because i know of this thing um yeah. but maybe you could like just quickly teach me about it because yeah. it's like is this like when you say a dom merging algorithm is this kind of like mm -hmm. what elixir live view does or something like yeah. some kind of dom diffing like that anyway, yeah, for those exactly. who don't know, you should explain maybe from scratch what basically you know, the the fundamental problem and the original library that, yeah well i mean yeah. the the original the original problem is you've got a dom yeah which is a tree of stuff and you've got a new tree that you need to take this tree and like change it into this other tree and you want to do that with as few changes as possible um and so th that that's called morphing that's what the web oh, people have called know, it there was You've got that thing with like the Rick Astley video that you get yeah, to keep playing yeah. or something. Is that yep. that's is that yeah. one of these examples? That's, that's, yeah, it's not in, it's not in the examples. Okay. But if you go to the bottom of the idiomorph page, there's there's an example that shows that. Uh -huh. um, yeah, yes, it's down there somewhere. So if you watch this GIF, like that top is what basically what happens is if you if you watch the top top one, the video keeps playing, or the the top one resets and the bottom one doesn't. Um, and so, like, yeah, Morphdom doesn't work, right? Yeah, that's so refresh there. Morphdom resets the video. Yeah. yeah. And so, well, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this, but basically, Idiomorph is an improvement on Morphdom. It uses something called ID sets to to do a better job of matching up elements um, when it's trying to... And so, basically, the, I can return a bigger chunk of a bigger HTML partial yeah. into something where some of what I return is the same as what was there before, and it yeah. won't actually replace what was there. So it'll be kind of more yeah, efficient. It, doesn't, it, it won't update the state. Exactly. It doesn't make mistakes higher in the DOM because it has these things called ID sets. So okay. I don't know. And then there's and then there's hyperscript. <laughs> don't show anyone, but um, now I mean you say this so because like asked uh, you know, a few weeks ago I asked you about this. And I was like, should I learn hyperscript? <laughs> and you're like, no. And that was the end of the conversation. No. And no. then since then, I've like seen people using it. And I'm like, wait, this looks amazing. <laughs> Somebody on the Discord yeah. yesterday had like literally like a spreadsheet written in HyperScript. Yeah. So I actually yeah, want to try it. that was pretty incredible. Yeah, uh, so HyperScript's another project. Um, and uh, it's basically a scripting language. So it's, a, it's an alternative to JavaScript. An mm -hmm. that, and uh, it's based on a, an old scripting language called HyperTalk, which was yeah, a scripting language for uh, HyperGuard, exactly. Which is also and what so, AppleScript um, was based on, you know, same. Yeah, kind of. AppleScript has given a lot of people a bad taste for that style of language because AppleScript is so bad, which I agree 100%. Um, but uh, 
it's it, it has a lot of interesting features. I teach compilers, and uh, I like programming languages, and so um, you know, I enjoyed reading the source uh, code to this actually. Like it's yeah, it, it's yeah. I thought like okay, I can see you're an academic who you probably must teach this shit because it's pretty hardcore. <laughs> like I, I yeah, recognize it. it. Is, it yeah, it's a it's a standard recursive descent parser and all that sort of stuff. But you can see like these things. It's just like on click toggle disabled until, you know, it's a, it has a very English like syntax. Um, and then the, the really interesting thing about it, if you go up to the top, um, go up to the where, where's the nav or excuse me, go to uh, docs. Um, is scroll down on the left hand side, go down to uh, uh, keep going, keep going. What's it called? Keep going. Uh, keep going, keep going. It's async transparency. So if you're a, if you're if you're into languages, this is one thing that's pretty interesting about HyperScript, um, which is that it um, the way the the runtime works, like you don't have to resolve promises. The runtime effectively resolves all the promises I, for I you. I hate this so, JavaScript code. You know, <laughs> right. it just makes me miserable. So, right. Yeah. So instead of like this callback style or doing a wait, you know, there's a if if the thing you're working with returns a promise, you can do an await on it, but then you have to mark it as async and all the rest of oh it. My God, like in HyperScript, you just yeah. In HyperScript, you just you can put like wait one second and it'll do it does all the stuff for you. It like it it waits for that two seconds and then starts executing the next thing. And so that's a that's sort of a it's an interesting technical thing. Like if you scroll down a little bit further, um, there's uh, keep going toggle loops. This one. Um, so this uh, scroll up there that loop. This is a this so one of the neat things about the the runtime infrastructure of HyperScript is that you can have event driven loops. So this this is this is a loop that's saying loop until you get this event, right? So on click repeat until event stop. Oh, I love it. And so, and then send and then there's another button that sends the stop event. So if you click on that click me to pulse button there. Yeah it's going to pulse and yeah. then it, it, it'll keep pulsing until you click cancel. Yeah. Um, Which is sending and when you click a stop cancel, event to a particular element. Yeah, yeah. To the previous button. And so it's sending it to that button. And what's interesting there is that if you watch the pulse, it finishes, it, it, it the pulse finishes. And that's because it, uh, that's because it's in this loop that only after the loop is finished, does it check? Did I receive this stop event? And so it's like it's event driven control flow, which is pretty interesting. Like when you're working with the DOM. So I don't know. This is definitely a passion project. I have a hard time recommending any anyone watching yeah. this or listening to this check it out. But it's yeah. got some cool ideas in it. I I know those <laughs> kinds of projects. Like I, I'm a bit the same with NB Dev. You know, when people are like, mm. "Should I use NB Dev?" I'm like. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I like it a lot. I've written all my software yeah. for the last few years and it, you know, people keep right. asking me, how come I'm so productive? And I'm like, I, I think a lot of it's because of MB dev, but should you use it? Oh, I don't know. It's pretty weird. <laughs> you know, what everybody's <laughs> going to think you're weird. Yeah. And, um, right. Yeah. It's funny though, like, uh, you know, the, the, this kind of parsing, compiling stuff, I've, I happen to have been lucky enough to have a few friends in my life who, you know, have, who are amongst the best in the world there, like, Terence Parr, who created yeah. Antler, was a sure. colleague at the University of San Francisco, and Chris yeah. Lattner, obviously. And then years ago, I back in the Pell days, I used to spend some time with Damian Conway on Pell. Oh, um, wow. It's such an interesting space, you know, of yeah. like like getting down to the hardcore of these algorithms and then implementing a language. Yeah. I mean, it must have been super fun for you just to make this. Thing. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, for sure. And it's all written in JavaScript. So the parser, yeah, so. it's all, it's all in JavaScript, um, which is so the performance crazy is going to be mean, a little bit dodgy, I guess, like it has to, I, wouldn't, it and... I would not write a, yeah, I would not write a Bitcoin miner in it for sure. <laughs> um, but I think for what it's designed for, like little interactive elements, like where you embed the code, like it's designed to be embedded in HTML, like it's supposed to be and, and very readable, like, that's one thing. There's an essay, I think. Uh, what on, there's an essay on the HTMX website about that. About uh, I think it's right-click view source extremism. I think is what I call it. Hold on, I'll look. It's that last one. Um, and uh, so this is a the kind of riffing on something like Corey Doctorow, who's a real good writer. Yeah, kind real of good. a guy who's very passionate about too. the web. Yeah. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, he talked about how like the early web, you could always look, you could view like one of the reasons why the web was so great is you could, if you saw something cool, you could right click and view the source and see what was going on. Yeah. And, um, and so that's one thing that I think HTMX and HyperScript kind of have that. Yeah. Like I, I believe in that ethos. The like exactly. It's not open source. It's not open source. It's it's view source. <laughs> it's no, no. It's, like, exactly. it's not that. Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, I really kind of leaned into that with, like, one of the things I created for fast HTML is like I really love being able to like even just view you know, view HTMX or HTML or right. whatever source. And so one of the things I kind of show people in our very first video is this idea of like copy outer HTML, paste it into HTX, and now you've got, you know, the fast tag tag right. ready to go. It's like I really wanted people to right. be able to grab stuff that's out there. Yeah. 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 There's something that we've definitely lost in the web now that everything's like a huge mass of you know, either it's a bunch of like, you. if you want to cry, like go and look at, go to google.com and right click view source and then go to the Wayback machine Oh, I know. and go to google.com in like 2002 and yeah. view the source of that. And it's just like, guys, <laughs> what are we doing? You know, like it's yeah, just and I crazy. I wouldn't say how... that the current, I don't find the current Google a better experience to use than. It's not, I mean, you know, it's ones. a little better in some ways. But you know, I, so I do. I do like the the openness and the. So that's one of the, the reason I'm on this kind of riff is just because HyperScript is designed to be part of that. Like, you yeah, know, you put the code in, you put the code directly in the. In and the you market. know, there's another one. And, I don't know if you've tried it readable. at all, um, which is uh, Surreal JS, which is actually what what I mm. after you convinced me not to use HyperScript. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. It's almost as weird, but not quite. But it's a similar yeah, idea, is by, which is yeah, yes, I got by Nat, yeah. So there's this like nice example here, yeah. You know where you can inspect these things, and yeah, again, they're just like right there, and it's just yeah, like, it's me. just a script tag right next to the thing, yeah, yeah. Yep. And you know, yeah. also this really beautiful CSS, <laughs> like not like this is three twenty lines, you know. Yep. And then the CSS one is like 50 lines or 40 lines or something, but it's like, yep. in many ways, it kicks Tailwind's ass. You know, you just have like me yeah. in your styles. Yep. And then it works yeah. really well with um, the fast HTML approach that we, we're yeah. trying to create Python components, you know, where it's just right. Python functions and the Python functions are self-contained. And so with something like right. HTMX or with the surreal approaches, you know, everything is like you don't need web components anymore because right. the server's generating the components. So I'm really in right. that direction. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a good one. I it's uh, you know, and that's a quick I mean, I guess like maybe a last question for you is how's uh how's fast HTML treating you? <laughs> I saw you got a couple of negative content. It's always easy to focus on the negative stuff, but I've seen a tremendous amount of positive stuff too. So Yeah, it's been less than a week. Um, let's see, we've got 2.7 thousand stars on GitHub. So it's like people definitely gravitated go. to it. It was number one on Hacker News. Yeah. Um, the reaction has been, yeah, it's interesting. Like we get, I get reactions to a few different things, right? So like a lot of the people reacting to fast HTML aren't reacting to fast HTML at all, but actually yeah. like, so for example, uh, I use a different um, programming style guide, uh, which I wrote mm -hmm. called Fast AI Style instead of the one that most, pretty much everybody else uses called Pep8. Okay. And it's based on like literally 60 years of study, you know, in, in other communities. Right. Like it's not bad, right. but because right. people see my code looking different to what they used to, a lot of people just react to like, this code is wrong or it's bad, right. you know. Although the, right. other, the other thing I've seen people react to is... Like, um, wait, it's ninety-one percent Jupyter notebooks. It's actually worse than that because <laughs> the other eight percent is auto-generated. Um, people <laughs> are like, yeah, it's like it looks wrong. It's written wrong. It's written in the wrong system. So you know, right. I get a lot of that. Um, yeah. I definitely I get some of that too with with uh, HTMX. So <laughs> yeah, you're doing it wrong. And then people are like, well, 
you know, you're never going to be able to create something that looks nice with like tailwind and stuff like this, you know, and I'm like, dude, this is like a fast HTML application <laughs> right here. You know, right. it, it's, uh, um, Looks pretty here's, good a great, to me. here's a great example. This thing here is like something that wrote like a mm -hmm. standalone thing. And then now that we've got it, you know, it's just like card 3d, there it is. Yep. And there's this like, there's some things with, where I just, it's a bit like what you're saying with HTMX, but to a lesser extent where like this one. So this is actually the current temperature. And it's like, well, okay. how the hell are we getting the current temperature on the homepage of a really popular website, you know? Right. And the cost of running this, you know, incl you know including the entire launch on Hacker News and all that is right. like, uh, yeah, you know, it's going to cost ah. 20 bucks, right? Three bucks so far. Man, I need um, to look into Railway app. <laughs> it's, and the trick is that, I just used um, Python, right? And I, this is this yeah. function actually has a cache on it, and yeah. and then I realized like, well, actually, what? So the normal Python cache um, uh, basically is just like a memoization cache, so it's like an LIU cache. Yeah. Um, so like, I wrote this tiny thing called Flexi Cache. You know, and like everything I write, Carson is just like tiny, right? So this is yeah, like one of the biggest functions I've ever written is like 30 lines of code. <laughs> um, but with this cache, you can then say, you can basically define these uh, things are called policies. So here's a okay. policy cache, which is just like, oh, let's check the time, you know? And mm. you either return none if it's still in cache or you return the new cache time, you know, or the, you know, or the whatever mm -hmm. state you need. So there's an M time policy. So like we have... I basically replaced static site generators now because I just returned file responses with an M time policy cache. So like it literally gives you mm -hmm. auto reload if the file changes, you know, that thing right. I was showing with the weather has like a one minute time policy cache on it and it's just a decorator on the function. And so now, sure. you know, this, you know, just updates itself once a minute. So it's like using all of Python, um, right. really, it just feels great. So yeah, so to yeah. answer your question, you know, this kind of new generation of JavaScript only programmers, you know, there's quite a common reaction, which is like, you can't do all these things. It's like, yeah. you know, Instagram's written in Python, Dropbox is written in Python. Like it, it <laughs> right. can definitely create whatever application you have in your head. Yeah. Um, but then there's this fantastic group of like very experienced coders who have like, come in to our like discord channel and just been like this is the thing you know so like for example sure. audrey and daniel who i mentioned these fantastic authors and you know really great web developers within like two days of checking it out not only had audrey won a hackathon but they're like we mm. want to fly to australia to spend two weeks working on this with you please wow so they're going to be coming like next week or cool. the week after and we're just going to hang out here in my backyard man um yeah. yeah. So like that kind of reaction of people who I really respect who just go like, Yeah, I I wanna focus on this as my you know, yeah. as my work for, for a while. sure. And they're reacting yeah. a lot to HTMX. Do you know what I mean? Like I feel like what we're doing is yeah. we're providing this surface to allow people to create hypermedia applications. Um, right. you know, and it's just cobbling together like the idea of functional components that goes back a long time in like OCaml, Haskell, right. Elm, of course, history, you know, then the, yeah. you know, the HTMX approach, you know, the, the ASGI approach of like simplifying HTML a whole lot, just kind of like right. cobbles together these things and like the whole thing's like yeah. 800 lines of code. You know, and HTMX yeah. is pretty small as well, I think, right? Uh, the implementation. Yeah, it's, well, I think it's <laughs> it's 4,000 lines of code now, or maybe even 5,000, because we added so many type annotations. I yeah. think if you looked at like actual lines of code, yes. it's just, I don't know, man. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, Whatever. I, it found zero bugs, by the way, but it's all I was going to say, um, I don't do type <laughs> annotations in Python because I've... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we've I got think. a pretty good test suite. So, exactly. but it's all, it's fine. It's all good. People want it and now they've right. got it. So, um, 
but uh but it is you know yeah i think if you boiled it down and sort of into normal code i bet it's a couple thousand lines of code yeah you know um and i don't write the most efficient like lines of code style code i tend to write very plotting code where um at this point so um but uh yeah you know i the, you say it's only 800 lines of code but obviously it's 800 lines of code that do the right thing or a lot better than 100,000 lines of code that does the wrong <laughs> yeah. thing so that's one of the one good thing about getting kind of old is you start realizing what the right thing might be <laughs> well exactly and you suddenly discover these people who have built built the right thing like when i came across the real js and i was like oh yeah self contained components yep. It's yeah. almost like a kind of discovery again of like, oh, there are these, these things that when you put them together, yeah. it creates something delightful, you know? Yeah. And combine well. Uh, yeah. So I've created all these little apps now. So like this thing uh, the other day, I was like, I, I was on the plane. And so I started writing a blog post in Microsoft Word, you know? And I was like, okay, I want to convert this to Markdown. And... Yeah. I was like, okay, I can't find anything that does a great job of converting it to Markdown. I'll write a fast HTML app to convert it to Markdown. That took me like two hours, you know, yep. chuck it up on the web. And sure. I found like this obscure little JavaScript library somebody had used. So I basically hooked up with HTMX. <laughs> you know, I used HX yeah. files, which lets mm -hmm. you call JavaScript kind of before it passes it back to your handler. And yeah. so I was able to that way get this JavaScript client side cleaned up thing. And then I used a Python markdown converter and then yeah. used that to update. And I, it's kind of funny, the, the, uh, the way I actually had it set up is that you paste into this text box. Uh, the on paste event basically is the thing that causes the handle to happen. Yeah. So right. it actually pastes the markdown. <laughs> so it's kind of this weird yeah. U, UI experience of like literally copy from uh word and paste and it the mark kind of piece so yeah so i kind of create Sweet. all these little things and they just feel good and i think like yeah we, this is yeah. this is the right way to do this stuff um so. yeah well it's really good that it's scratching your like the fact that you're using it and it's not just you, you kind of inventing this tool for the world oh. you know i think and that's my really, team loves it too like my friend jono yeah. he wrote this thing called moodle it's so fun and like so he's somebody who spends all his weekends like tinkering with i don't know robots right. or art right. or whatever he's a inveterate tinkerer and nowadays it's a good sign that he always wants to tinker with fast html so he made this thing called moodle right. where you go to the site and it gives you basically a pictionary type word you have to draw right. you start drawing it and then there are three different language uh, three different language models running in the background that are trying to guess what you're drawing and ah. as soon as one guesses correctly you're done. And so there's like a leaderboard. It's all HTMX Sweet. based, you know, of like who managed yeah. for each word, get it done the fastest. Right. And again, it's yeah. combining like canvas and, you know, all these things of like, right. oh, HTMX can't do that. Um, and I'm yeah, sure that's we're not a good doing that well, exactly right. like, but, you know, it does the <laughs> well, job. But exactly. And it's it's not that HTML, like HTMX isn't trying to do all that, right? It's there to work with canvas and with, you know, JavaScript and whatever else it needs to work with. Yeah, and we get our leaderboard and we get our like, you know, right. and we're using the WebSockets yeah. thing, um, which, is, yeah. which is nice. And um, yeah. I'm about to dig into the server side events extension. That looks nice as well. Yeah. Yeah, server sent events. The those are you know two extensions, WebSockets and server sent events. I like the server sent events one. It's read only, so as long as yeah. you're just consuming stuff. Um, it's good for language models too. that stream the results back right. to you, so you basically read it until yeah, it's finished. Totally. Yeah. Um, a lot of that, you know, be, being able to use that depends a lot on what your server side environment gives you too. So you know, if if there's good support for it using whatever your server side environment is, then you. Can, you can take advantage of them. Yeah, no, um, I mean, with ASGI, it's all like async Python, so everything works yeah. pretty cleanly. I mean, not as cleanly as the hyperscript example <laughs> that you showed. Sure. The other thing I like about with right. these things like WebSockets or server-side events or whatever is this idea of like, oh, you want to like stop the connection? It's like, well, you literally mm. just return a new DOM element that doesn't have a <laughs> WebSocket, right. you know, attribute in it anymore. Like, it's like... yep. When you got a hammer, everything's a nail. Well, kind of in HTMX, yeah. everything is a nail. <laughs> you know, it's like right. how yeah, many everything's things a nail. Just no, no, no. I'm kidding. Some elements. 
Right. Everything's a dumb element. It's not a div, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, again, I feel like just what you said originally, like it's more, I discovered this than anything else. And it does, it, it works for a lot of stuff, <laughs> you know? And if you're, you know, like, it sounds like what you got, you guys are approaching it the right way, which is I'm not going to try and make HTMX do stuff. It's not good at, I'm going to, instead, I'm going to integrate with HTMX via events. And that's what I try to tell people. That's what in my mind makes someone a good HTMX developer um, is if they they get that okay like start thinking in events and I've got the, these other tools that I want to integrate and now how do I integrate them cleanly hopefully they have a good event model or maybe I have to yeah. impose one on top of it or something like that so well, maybe I should I think that's know, the right way I should talk to you sometime about my my coming up plans I'm hoping to actually create a kind of like web programming from scratch course and I've actually now created yeah. this whole thing where I like literally it's a notebook that starts with a socket handler and builds okay. up HTTP and then builds up yeah. ASGI and, you know, cool. um, I'm, yeah, really hoping that a lot of people will understand the pleasure of this style of web development. And I also want to introduce people right. to things like pay five bucks a month to run your own VPS that you SSH into right. and you deploy things by R-syncing to it and, you know, like, right. yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a superpower, I think, to have those. It is absolutely. Ignorance. I'm teaching a I'm teaching a class at MSU this fall on hypermedia, and so I'll be teaching sort of similar things. Will you have a chance um, to record any of that, or um, you know, I've got to I've got to talk to the department. <laughs> but uh, well, you know, maybe alternatively, maybe. you know, we can do something together. We could show some of your slides if you're allowed to, and yeah, like, yeah, know, team up. Or yeah, something. that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'll. Uh, I'll. Be, I'll. I'll do, I need. To, I just want to. I need to. Right now, it's summertime, so everyone's gone, and no one responds. <laughs> but, um, but as, I'll, I'll talk to them as soon as everyone. They should be back in a couple weeks here. So. Well, Cassin, I really appreciate it. it. Must be getting a little late in the evening for you. So, um, I feel like. Yeah, it's not too bad. I've learned a lot, and I feel like I've hopefully yeah. helped other people learn a lot. Um, yeah. Is there anything Good. else you wanted to say or ask or anything before we? wrap up no i just you know congratulations on the launch and i really appreciate you know your support and look like you i know, said you over email i'm embarrassed by it because i feel like all i'm doing is showing people what you already made so i hope i don't get too much <laughs> well, credit you know obviously that's not true but um you know uh the i think the python community has been a big source of you know htmx people excited about yes. htmx because they can stay in python um exactly. and so you know, I, uh, I'm just, I'm excited to see what you guys are, what you guys are going to be able to do with this tool. It looks really, really neat. Thank you, sir. Have a great night. Yep. You as well. Bye-bye.